Hello there. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marcia, the webinar director here at Advice Chaser, and we're excited to have you here. Before we introduce our guests and get started, I do need to do a little bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting, are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We'll, we are thrilled to bring you this educational presentation. Attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box, and the presenters will answer the, the presenter will answer those queries uh, during our question and answer period today at the end of the presentation. Leo, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, if you ask a question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. If we can't get to your question during today's event, we'll make sure to reach out to you to make sure that gets addressed. We want this experience to be as educational as possible. So again, please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. That is what we are here for today. Well, I'd love to introduce you to our presenter today. And uh, it, thank you, Leo. Leo's running the slideshow for me today here at the beginning. Uh, Leo Wong is a fiduciary financial planner with Grand Vest Financial Group, specializing in new client acquisition and market research. Leo, the youngest of three boys, was born in Malaysia and immigrated to the United States at a young age. Leo and his family went on to successfully own and operate several restaurants throughout central New Jersey. Leo graduated from Christian Brothers Academy and Monmouth University with a BS in finance and currently resides in Monmouth County, New Jersey. About his reasons for becoming a financial advisor, Leo says, my passion for becoming a financial advisor stemmed from the seeds that my parents planted when they came to America in the early 90s. As a restaurant entrepreneur, my parents worked 72 hours a week that provided food and shelter for the family over a decade. As grateful as I was for my parents instilling work ethic upon my siblings and I, they never developed a retirement nest egg for themselves. And as a first generation immigrant, I can relate with those who work hard to provide their, but for their family, but lack the knowledge or insight to plan for retirement. That's why it brings me a sense of fulfillment when I'm able to help families plan for their future. Leo, uh, we're so excited to have you back. I know that we have done a previous webinar about uh, uh, understanding retirement for federal employees. And this is a, a sort of a deep dive into the thrift savings plan. And um, so we're really excited to have you present. I'm gonna turn the time over to you. Thank you, Marcia. And, and yes, it is great to be back as well. Uh, I really love providing these educations uh, for the folks that either don't have that type of education or simply don't have the resources to be able to ask, uh, ask uh, financial professionals in how to navigate, uh, especially using your TSP, uh, which can be argued is the most important part about your financial plan as a federal employee. So uh, this really brings me great joy to be able to do that, especially talking about how your TSP is supposed to be invested in this current market and just understanding how to maximize the opportunity that you have as a federal employee using your TSP. Now, for your TSP, my agenda today is going to be very high level. I'm going to start off with helping you understand what is your TSP first off and what are the different funds that you have available that you could be using. And then I'm gonna get into more of the specific details about what strategies, 
some people are using in this current market environment, especially being that the market's down anywhere from 20 to almost 30 percent uh, year to date. And, and then, of course, for some of you folks, you might even be considering drawing from your TSP sooner than later. So what are the restrictions there and what age uh, would be uh, qualified to do so? And then, of course, we're going to talk about your options with your TSP during retirement. What can you do with the money after you retire? And I'm going to cap off with some of the new features within your TSPs uh, that has uh, recently transpired last month. As, uh, as most of you may have, may or may not have noticed, they did a revamping of your TSP website requiring everyone to create new logins and provide uh, better security moving forward. Uh, so uh, hang tight for today's agenda. Uh, there's gonna be some great information. I'm not gonna be able to cover every single detail. However, as Marche said earlier, please do re uh, leave comments, questions and such like that. And uh, we will have a little Q&A at the end of the session as well. So let's dive right in. Understanding your TSP. So your TSP was established by Congress in 1986, right? Uh, that is three years after they introduced the first retirement system. And it's essentially a defined contribution plan, but specifically for only federal employees. Uh, it is designed to be the third leg of your retirement right behind your pension and social security. And it could be compared to the 401k in the private industries. Uh, however, your, your uh, value of your TSP is fully determined by what you're contributing into it on a biweekly basis, along with the agency's matching, uh, plus whatever gains occur throughout the years of your working career. And they were nice enough to introduce the Roth side of the TSP in 2012 to provide a tax-free uh, retirement plan uh, within the same platform. Now, what are the advantages here of your TSP? Well, simply put, you have the tax deferral uh, uh, status uh, when you put the money into your traditional TSP side, where you can defer all the taxation until you decide to withdraw down the road. Uh, it is payroll deducted, so it comes right out of the paycheck. Uh, so there's no thinking about it. It just happens on your behalf, very easy. Uh, they allow you to choose amongst the five diversified funds that they have available, just to keep it simple. As I mentioned earlier, you now have the traditional and Roth options, and they are one of the lowest fee structures and expenses available of all retirement plans. And lastly, you do get the agency matching maximum of 5%, as long as you put in five yourself. So that is a nice incentive to uh, let you incentivize you to be contributing into your TSP at a minimum of 5% to get the full matching. Uh, we did have a question. If you can go back to that, Leo, really quickly. Yes. Uh, the question was, how does this differ from what might be in the private sector? Is there? Yeah. So there, in terms of the difference, there's no difference from private sector. Uh, it just every 401k plan is different in, for their matching program. Some will match uh, dollar for dollar up to a certain percentage, which is this case. Uh, for the TSP, some will only match, uh, you know, up to 50% of whatever your contribution is, and some will uh, do a hybrid of the both as well. So it really varies in the private sector, but for the TSP specifically, if you put in 5% yourself, you will also get the 5% matching. Thank you for that, uh, that question. Yeah, good question. So how does the matching work here? The matching is actually pretty straightforward, but a lot of people kind of misconstrue it. Uh, for folks that decide not to contribute any of their uh, TSP into the TSP at all, they actually still get a 1% matching from the agency regardless, uh, which is a, a really nice plus. But <laughs> That's that unusual. <laughs> that is unusual, you're yeah. absolutely correct. Uh, but, but it's a nice thing that the agency does, that's great. 
but as you go up the, the, uh, the list here or down the list, if you as an employee put in 1%, you technically get 2% matching. If you put in two, you get 3% matching. You put in 3%, you actually get 4% matching. Now this is where it gets a little uh, wonky. When you put in 4%, they give you 4.5% matching. And then when you put in 5%, they match the five uh, onwards. Now, anything above 5% on the employee side of contribution does not increase the matching side of 5%. So 5% is capped out at this point. Uh, so, but there are incentives to still continue uh, contributing above the 5%, which I'll cover later on. And as a side note, it is a per pay period basis benefit. So you have to finish out your pay period in order to get that full matching of 5%. Now, in terms of your contribution limits, a lot of people ask me, well, how do I max out my contributions? And there is a limit to how much you can put into UTSP each year. And you have to be cautious of this because I do run across some uh, ambitious uh, savers and I'll, I'll explain the, uh, some of the, the pros and cons there as well. However, to start off, your contribution limit for 2022 is $20,500. That means that's the maximum dollar amount you get to contribute into UTSP, uh, which is contrary to a popular belief back in the day, which is percentage was the limit. So it's not really a percentage that is uh, limiting in how much you can contribute. It's actually a dollar amount. So for folks is 20,500 for this year, and it does, change periodically throughout the years uh, as especially with inflation uh, being one of the main uh, causes of that as well. For people that are over the age of 50, you have what's called a catch-up contribution. And that allows you to not only contribute the limit of 20,500, but in addition, you put in $6,500 as well. Uh, this is designed for people that want to be really aggressive in, in their investments, especially if they're kind of catching up from all the early year, earlier years that they uh, had limited uh, contributions. Uh, they're able to contribute more uh, because they're over the age of 50. So for a total of $27,000 is the legal limit you can put into your TSP, whether it's on the traditional TSP side or on the Roth side as long as you're over the age of 50. And I, you know, when I look at this number, yeah, people always kind of gawk at it. They're like, well, that's a lot. How much is that per pay period? Well, if you were to divide it over 26 pay periods, you're actually looking at about $1,038 per pay period. Every paycheck that comes in will go into your TSP if you want to strive for the limit. Now, that could be very daunting or impossible. Right now, I'm not advising everyone to do this and live on ramen noodles, of course. But uh, if you want to really strive for maximizing your contribution limits, this is what you want to achieve. As I mentioned earlier, there are some more uh, aggressive savers out there. And once in a while, I come across someone that over contributes into the TSP of that $27,000 limit before pay period 26. And that's where it gets a little dicey. Meaning if you were to hit the $27,000 limit of contribution for the year by pay period 2023, 20, uh, that means the remaining last three pay periods, you do not get the 5% matching from the agency because you already hit your limit on the contribution amount. So be careful for some of you overachievers out there. Uh, it actually is uh, not a good thing to be overly aggressive but really hit the, the mark, uh, making sure that it's 1,038 per pay period, starting from pay period one all the way to 26. For the traditional or the Roth side. Now, this is a very popular question I do get for people that always ask, which one is better, the traditional or the Roth? And the answer is, uh, it doesn't really matter actually. It, 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 uh, at the end of the day, as long as you're contributing into it, that's the most important part. However, I will say this one thing, for folks that are a lot younger, 
and I'm talking early career, maybe 20s or 30s, maybe even 40s, uh, for the people that are going to be working for 20, 30, 40 years, well, then it actually makes sense to be on the raw side, especially when you're younger, making a lower income. Uh, and you can afford to pay the taxes up front to be uh, contributed into the Roth first to let it compound to become tax-free down the road versus the traditional side. Let me, let me uh, clarify those points. So uh, with employees, you are allowed to make contributions to both options, either one, and the funds are separated for tax purposes. However, all of your agency matching contributions can only go to your traditional account. And uh, for example, if you were to contribute all your money into the Roth side, the matching of the 5% can still only go in the traditional side. And for Roth TSBs, the concept is you get taxed now out of your current paycheck and it goes into the Roth TSP. So more money is taken out of the paycheck because of the taxes that has to be uh, paid, but then it's a tax-free benefit later on it grows tax-free. As long as you had it for at least five years, when you withdraw from it, it'll be tax-free as well down the road. Versus the traditional side is what people are used to. Any money that you put into the traditional TSP is tax deferred growth, meaning no tax are taken out, right? Uh, so you're, you actually get a lot of tax benefits uh, for the current year for contributing into the traditional side. And then, of course, it reduces your taxable income and all the contributions and growth are taxed upon after you, uh, you are retired and withdrawn from the TSP at that point. So a good example I could put here is if you were to contribute, let's say, $20,000 into your TSP on the traditional side, that means when you do your income taxes for the year, they deduct 20% from your earned income. And if you are in a 20% income bracket for taxes, 20% of 20,000 is $4,000. Therefore, technically, if you put 20,000 into your TSP for the year, you're actually saving yourself about $4,000 in taxes or at least deferring it anyways. And when you, um, and you can elect which side to draw from, uh, or re roll over uh, uh, when you're in retirement. So they are two separate entities, essentially. Uh, they can never be commingled, uh, but you know, there's, uh, there's, you could choose either side, but majority-wise, traditional is what most of the contributors uh, are using. So that's the basics of the TSB there. Uh, and hopefully that was a good uh, little refresher for most of you, uh, and maybe eye-opening for some already. Uh, but the next part I want to dive into with you is understanding the different funds you have available on the platform. Now, for the different funds that you have, it really just boils down to five individual funds with a mix of what's called life cycle funds. Uh, and I believe that's about eight to 10 of them available on the platform where depending on the year you're retiring in uh, would be the life cycle fund that you want to elect. So the next available one that's going to be maturing soon is the L2025. Uh, but within those funds, it's basically a combination of the five funds that you see on the screen. So the five funds are the G, the F, and then the C, S, and I. For simplicity, simplicity's sake, I'm going to separate these into two categories, the G and the F fund, which stands for government security and fixed income fund, are what we categorize as a conservative funds. So the G fund cannot lose any money, is the only fund on there that is safe from market loss, but in return, the returns aren't as great either. As you see in the highlighted section, for year to date, it is currently at 1.15% right now. So it might close out at the 2% range at the end of the year. With inflation being at 9.1% of, as of last year due to CPI report, 
you're essentially net net losing to inflation at a 7% rate if that was the case. Now for the F fund, that is your fixed income fund, also known as your bond fund. And if you see the year to date returns on that on 2022 is negative 10%. And the reason why it's doing the worst that it's done in recent years uh, is because of rising interest rate environment, uh, which is negatively correlated with pricing of bonds, which is what the F fund is. So for the F fund for this year and most likely the ongoing next year or two, it's going to yield a very low or negative return because of rising interest rates. So in other words, your conservative side of the ledger here, the G and the F, are not great options currently within the TSP. However, if you're someone that is conservative, you're kind of pigeonholed uh, to only use those two funds for your conservative, conservative allocations. And then the other side of the ledger is your C for common stock index, S for small cap index, and your I for international funds. And those are what we categorize as growth funds. These are the funds that you invest in for higher returns in the market over the long run by taking full risk of the market. And year to date for 2022, one of the worst starts, by the way, that we've experienced since 1970 in the market uh, is down respectively about 20% for the C fund, 28% for the S fund, and approximately 19% for the I fund. So not doing that great this year, okay? And you could chalk this up to rising interest rate environment. You could chalk this up to supply chain uh, issues. You could chalk this up to uh, inflation. Uh, but there's a lot of negative headwinds that are really causing this market to pull back and, um, and of course, uh, really feel the pain that we haven't felt in a long time. Uh, but these are the only funds that you can use to have higher returns in the market as well. Uh, for example, if you were to look at, there we go, I'm going to use my pointer here. There we go. If you were to look at the C fund for last year, 28% return. Fantastic. Even 2020, when we had the COVID crash in March, 18% return at the end of the year. And of course, 2019, 31%. So these have the potential to really achieve high returns, but they also have the potential to really pull uh, uh, balances down um, and will more negatively impact for those that are also uh, near or are at retirement. Uh, being able to be exposed to this, uh, they are going to be having a hard time making it back up as the market continues uh, to develop. And of course, with the limited years in investments as well. Okay, so those are the five funds that you have on the platform to use. I want to really just educate you on, on what they look like, uh, especially for the folks that want to look at the 10-year average for the growth funds. Um, the C fund and the S fund, as you tell, are averaging in the past 10 years with everything that's happening right now, uh, around 13 to 10% respectively. And my suggestion for a lot of uh, a lot of people that are younger that wants to take advantage of the market, especially these lows, they should be taking more risk and uh, be allocated more towards the C fund and the S fund uh, versus the I fund uh, historically has always underperformed the C and S, uh, which uh, in my opinion, it is not worth taking the same risk uh, for half the potential returns that it has shown itself over the past 10 years. So, uh, so that's the five funds that you have available. My recommendation is always to educate yourself on understanding the individual funds, because then you could really custom tailor uh, how you want to be invested moving forward. And I'll talk more about uh, the type of investment that you should be allocated um, on the uh, future slide here, which actually is uh, the next slide. So. The, one of the major questions that I get a lot um, asked here, Marche, is, you know, Leo, with, with where we are in the marketplace right now, how should I be invested in the market? And that's a very hard question to answer because, you know, it's the same uh, different strokes for different folks. You know, people, 
you know, have certain investment objectives and certain risk tolerance that will also dictate how sh they should be invested. And then also the other major thing to be considering is how long do you plan on working? Because if you have a long investment horizon and you'll be working for 25, 30, 40 years, well, then you should be taking more risk with your portfolio. You should be allocated more towards the C for common stock and S for small cap, because those averages will play out in the long term and give you that 10% plus return that you are looking for uh, to achieve a, a much larger TSP balance. Uh, and because uh, risk is the price you have to pay for gains in the market long term. Uh, so everyone's going to be a little different, but I will go over um, maybe one or two examples of a strategy that we are currently taking today. But before we do do that, there's a second item that I do want to point out that has been a major confusion for uh, some folks out there. And that is your intra-fund transfer versus your contribution allocation. Now, I want to clarify this because I hear a lot of my clients or prospects that tell me, oh, yeah, I changed my TSP around to, you know, to be more safe or more aggressive. But sometimes they only change their contributions, not what their current balance is. So let's go over what they are high level first. So when we have uh, this chart here, uh, we have two things that's displayed. Uh, you have what's called an account balance and you have what's called a future contribution. So account balance is of the money that's currently in there, how is it currently invested, right? And that's how it's distributed accordingly on this chart. So this person is 98% of all their money in the G fund and 1% in CNS. So that's how it's currently invested. However, their future contributions talk about uh, their new money meaning every paycheck, when that money comes into your TSP, where does that money get invested into? And this person has their new money that comes in going into 50% C, 50% S. So if they have $300 contribution into TSP every paycheck, 150 goes into C fund, 150 goes into S. Okay, so those are two separate things. So when you make an intra-fund transfer, what you're doing is moving the balance of the TSP into the funds that you want versus if you change your contribution allocation, all you're doing is changing uh, what allocations, uh, where the, the contributions are going when the money comes in, what bucket do you want that to be invested in? So there are two separate things. Uh, a lot of times you do match them to make it the same in terms of strategy, but in this specific scenario, this is actually one of my clients that I helped uh, put together. Um, the timing was impeccable. It was actually at the, uh, at the uh, middle of 2021. And the reason being is this particular uh, client uh, actually is, going, is retiring at the end of this year. And as, as we strategized, we decided that we wanted to kind of draw a line in the sand, so to speak, and because it's more important for this person to protect their asset and what they have versus trying to um, um, participate in higher gains potentially moving forward. So what we actually did uh, was allocate 99% of the current balance that they have right now into the G fund. Now that's the only safe fund to have. So that's the only fund we could use. So that's what we did. So 98% of the money is protected from market loss not going to make much, but they're going to be contributing, I'm sorry, retiring at the end of this year anyways, uh, and they're going to be working with us uh, on that uh, in terms of a rollover. However, uh, what we also did strategically was we said, you know what, we still want some of our money to be participating in any potential market growth moving forward. So we're okay taking risk with just the new money, right? So the new money so whether it's $300, $500, $600 every paycheck is buying the C and the S fund currently. And thank God we did this before uh, the start of this year because they are 98% of the money did not participate in this year's market loss of 20%. Uh, 
uh, but their new money, they participate, but they're also buying the lows every paycheck as well. Uh, so hopefully it does make its way back up, uh, hopefully at the end of this year, if not sometime next year as well. So this is a great strategy uh, for, for folks that are near retirement, I would say in the next two or three years or less, and they want to protect what they have now, but they're comfortable taking risk with the new money that comes in and they're able to buy the lows of the market. So this is just one of the examples that we are able to custom tailor for a lot of our clients uh, to be able to uh, uh, have some skin in the game, so to speak, uh, with being invested in the market, with the CNS fund for potential growth, taking risk, but knowing that they have a good portion that is absolutely just tucked away at Fort Knox, uh, that is not going to uh, get uh, uh, bull bulldozed down by the market this year. Uh, but knowing that they're not really going to be, uh, you know, outpacing inflation, uh, which uh, will have a, a different strategy when they are retired and rolled over into an IRA. All right. So uh, that is the one of the strategies that we're currently taking. And I would encourage you, if you want to talk about what is the best strategy for you, uh, to also reach out and we'd be more than happy to answer those questions. But it really is uh, very dependent on your specific situation. Once again, your risk tolerance and your investment objectives. Another popular question I get would be, when am I able to start drawing from my TSP, right? It's funny how uh, you know, these type of questions are asked because uh, a lot of times they don't get the proper education from TSP on, uh, on these type of rulings. Uh, it's kind of a, um, you know, check out OPM or TSP website and and uh, kind of figure it out on your own type situation. Uh, but hopefully I'm, I'm able to kind of break that down for you uh, on this slide. So one of the first qualifiers is if you're over the age of 59 and a half and you're either still working or retired. So once you're over that age, uh, you are no longer subject to any early withdrawal penalties. Uh, which is a 10% penalty if you were to take out money earlier from your TSB before 59 and a half. And it doesn't matter if you're still working or retired, you have access to your TSP money at that age or older. Uh, you just have to pay taxes on it. No penalties, just taxes. If you're on the traditional side, to clarify. Now, the second qualifier is if you have what's called a qualified retirement. In other words, if you retire before 59 and a half, you are able to withdraw money out of your TSP with no penalty, just taxes as well. It's actually very special, unique rules, a ruling that TSP has that no other retirement plan has where they allow you to withdraw money from your TSP, as long as you have a qualified retirement without a 10% penalty. I'll give you two examples here. One example would be what's called MRA plus 30. For folks that have at least 30 years of service and they have MRA, which stands for minimum retirement age, that for most people is as early as 56 and odd months to 57. Uh, you can actually retire, have a qualified retirement, uh, and you are able to start withdrawing money from your TSP if you choose to do so uh, without any penalty, just taxes. And then the other example would be people under what's called the uh, special retirement provision, uh, also known as law enforcement officers. If they're law enforcement officers and uh, the LEO provision for federal employees, uh, they can retire as early as 50, actually. And it's qualified, meaning they can then at 50 start drawing from their TSP without any penalties as well. Not recommended because you'd be very young, but it is an option. So good to always know what your options are. And then the third one is if for some of you that are really, really loving your job and you love being able to be interacting with people and you're still working and you're over the age of 72, right? Oh, I'm sorry, you retire around the age of 72. 
you are subject to what's called the RMD, required minimum distribution age at 72, uh, where you can actually, well, you will be forced to start taking money out of your TSP uh, because Uncle Sam wants his taxes. Uh, and that would encourage you to either spend it to spur the economy or reinvest it into a brokerage account if you're uh, financially sound and don't need the distribution from RMD. So those, those are the, the, the ways to start drawing from UTSB and qualifiers. Uh, but the key note uh, is to also know that uh, there is a mandatory 20% federal tax withholding on the traditional TSP side. Uh, meaning whenever you take money out of your traditional TSP side, they have to withhold 20%. For example, if you withdraw $10,000 from your TSP, they will withhold $2,000 for taxes that will be sent to the IRS on your behalf. So when you do file your taxes, it's already known that that uh, withholding is completed and you just have to complete your taxes accordingly where you'll either get a small refund for it, the withholding, because you're a lower income bracket, or you might owe a couple of percentage points because you're still a high income earner in retirement. Okay, so 20% uh, mandatory withholding. Uh, the next part I wanna dive into here would be what are your options in retirement in regards to your TSP, right? What do people do with their TSP when they retire? Uh, and there are four major distinctions that you could kind of fall into. Uh, the first one is you could simply just leave the money in the TSD and just do monthly withdrawals. Once again, it is subject to taxation on the traditional side, mandatory 20%. But you could tell TSP to send you 500, 1,000, 1,500, as much as you like on a monthly basis until your TSD balance exhausts. And that's okay. Right, so that's one of the options. Uh, the second option is to leave it in the TSP, but you could purchase an annuity with the TSP, also known as annuitizing your TSP. All right, now what what do I mean by this? Well, if you look at the 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 chart or the the box to the right, you may have seen something like this in the past. Uh, I think they stopped doing it starting in 2021 or 2022 uh, because it was a little misleading. But, uh, but they're essentially saying that you could derive a certain amount of dollars from your TSP for the rest of your life if you choose to turn on the annuity. What this is saying is you're giving up the principal of your TSP in lieu of a monthly payment, in this example, 1712, for the rest of your life. That's all, nothing more, nothing less. But the downside with this option that a lot of people are not educated about is number one, you no longer have access to that balance anymore. So let's say if it's a $300,000 TSP, that balance of 300, 300,000 is no longer yours. It is with uh, the annuity company. Uh, so you have no more access to it. And if you were to pass away earlier than expected in the year five or 10, well, whatever balance is left in the TSP will be uh, kept by the annuity company, uh, not by your, not given out to your beneficiaries. Uh, so not a great option for a majority of people out there, uh, but it is an option. Uh, if it suits you, great. But for most of our clients, it is not a great idea. Uh, the third option here is a lump sum withdrawal, right? You take out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000, either in full or partial. Now, when I say full, I mean, you know, like that scene from Jerry Maguire, where it says, show me the money, right? Uh, and uh, if you were to cash out your whole entire TSP balance in one lump shot, you're gonna really uh, regret it because you're gonna be owing taxes for that full balance because it's almost as if you made an additional uh, balance uh, income of that balance. So if it's $300,000, you're getting taxed at whatever bracket $300,000 is which is essentially the highest bracket out there. So not a great idea, so don't do that. Uh, but if you take out partial lump sum withdrawals, they do allow you four times a year uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in the increments that you do like, right? Uh, so uh, what, in, in lieu to that, one of the main things that I get asked uh, and why people consider that is they wanna pay off their mortgage. 
Now, this is a big one for a lot of people. Do I pay off my mortgage? Do I not? I'd rather not, right? And it, honestly, it's it really just depends, once again, what your interest rate is, what your monthly cash flow is. And for a lot of people, it might be a lifelong dream of theirs to be retired and have their home pay off, paid off. And if that's the case, then that's more of a emotional response and that might trump logical, uh, but it really depends. But I would say in my professional opinion, majority wise, not worth taking a large lump sum amount of ETSP to pay off a uh, hundred or 200 or $300,000 mortgage. It is not worth it because of the taxes you pay. And of course, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're essentially, uh, you're essentially handicapping yourself uh, for future uh, potential gains, especially if your interest rate is manageable in the three or 4% level, whereas the market could uh, most likely yield a higher amount than that uh, throughout your lifetime. But once again, it is situational. And the last one would be rollover into an IRA. So an IRA stands for individual retirement account. You can open this at any fin financial institution out there, TD Ameritrade, Vanguard, uh, Fidelity, right? All those big guys. Uh, but with an IRA, it provides you a lot more control, more flexibility, but more options as well. Now, when I talk about your, uh, your control and flexibility, I'm talking about having an IRA, you could dictate the terms on, on how that money is invested. Uh, if you want to take out monthly distributions, heck, you could even like what uh, withholding you want for taxation. I have some clients that only withhold 10% because they're in their low income bracket. I have some that don't want to pay taxes uh, just yet and they'll, uh, they'll pay it at the end of the year, but you have that option. Um, and lastly would be investment solutions. You could invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, commodities, real estate. The world is your oyster in terms of what you can invest in. And, and that's, in my opinion, more important uh, because as a retiree, having more options to invest in is key to developing the proper investment portfolio. And then of course, uh, when you are rolling the TSP into an IRA, uh, there's no taxes, there's no penalties, there's no fees, because all you're doing is moving it from a tax-deferred retirement account, account to another tax-deferred retirement account, all right? Uh, so uh, those are some of the things that we uh, assist our clients with and, and educating them on the option, but also helping them execute accordingly uh, with whatever uh, suits their needs the best. And that brings us to the last part here, uh, which is the TSP features uh, that have been improved uh, on the new update. So uh, for most of you, you should have logged into your TSP by now. If not, please do so. Everyone has a new login that they need to create now. So please try and make sure that you have that login uh, because it's gonna be essential now that they're really pushing everything to be done online and really taking away the, the paper and pen situation. So some of the new features uh, that have been uh, approved on uh, is number one, they have what's called AVA, a virtual assistant chatbot, uh, basically artificial intelligence that can answer basic questions and direct you to the right parts of the website for any inquiries. Uh, they do have a new interface to be user-friendly, uh, which a lot of my clients can argue uh, otherwise right now. Uh, that is user friendly. Um, in fact, is uh, for some people they say it's counterintuitive. Um, they have launched a TSP mobile app as well for the the younger generation that are comfortable using that. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is the transactions are all completed entirely online now. Uh, back uh, before the update, you were required uh, to actually print out a form to get it notarized uh, to then be able to roll over. Uh, money uh, into an IRA. Uh, now it's all done online and sent directly to the, the custodian of choice. Uh, they do provide personalized support for rolling your money into your TSP account as well. Uh, so if you need help with that, that's probably one of the big things that uh, I get asked a lot with how do I send money from my old 401k that I used to work at into my TSP now that I started a new uh, a career with the federal government. 
It used to be a TSB 60 form, uh, but now they are actually uh, doing it online now um, through their uh, uh, platform queue. And lastly, the, the mutual fund window. So this has been unrolled for a lot of people as well uh, to provide a, a more investment options. I believe they provide another 800 new mutual funds that you can invest in. Uh, the, the only handicap to it is you can only max out at 25% of whatever your TSB assets are into that mutual funds that if, if you want to, uh, to invest there. Uh, but the downside with that is you have to do your own due diligence with that. Right. Uh, so, and of course, there are higher fees within that mutual fund window. Now that those are new features, let's talk about some of the pros and cons, right? Some of the things that are, are known issues as well. So, some participants, and when I say some, I'm talking about close to, to maybe about 10% of participants, are reporting issues that they're having uh, with, uh, with the system. Uh, so as of June 24th, about 90% of participants accessing the system have successfully set a new login, but that also means out of the 6.6 .6 million participants, about 660,000 are still having issues. Not to mention there is a long wait time for customer service line, uh, if you ever called. In fact, the last one we did, we hung up after 45 minutes because we weren't getting anywhere with uh, TSP hotline. But some of the other known issues that we are experiencing right now are number of phone calls going into the call centers being a long queue, uh, vendor staffing projections, uh, waiting time for callers, login processing problems, and of course, some of the software defects. You know, for some people, they have that they can't use Internet Explorer or they have to use Google Chrome or Safari. Uh, they're still kind of figuring those things out. Uh, but hopefully in due time, they do get it right. Uh, but this has caused a lot of frustration for people with the TSP. And that's part of the reason why a lot of people are uh, um, kind of migrating out of the TSP. Um, when they either are A, retired, or B, turn 59 and a half and still working. Uh, because this it's becoming more and more safeguarded security purpose for the TSP, which is the opposite of ease of use, especially for the boomer generation uh, that are looking to just be able to talk to someone and have things explained in English and execute it according to their wishes without having to jump through multiple hoops remembering multiple passwords, and, and of course, um, understanding their tax liability when they do take distributions out as well. So uh, that is the TSP update uh, with that. Uh, so that leads to the conclusion of my, uh, my webinar here. And I, I, I hope everyone got a lot out of this presentation. Uh, one of the things I did not clarify in the beginning is that uh, we, uh, our, our firm works um, hand in hand specifically with federal employees uh, because we are a charter federal employee benefit consultant designations uh, in our team. Uh, we are able to advise you legally on your TSP investments uh, as well as help you construct the proper investment portfolio uh, when you are ready to transition into the retirement field. Uh, so uh, definitely take advantage of the help that we provide here at Advice Chaser. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful summer. Stay tuned for our next federal webinar uh, coming later this summer as well. Back to you. Uh, Leo, we do have some questions before we end. So I oh, want to go right, ahead. Oh, Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. It was a great outro. And um, we'll definitely bear that in mind but we do have a couple questions probably more than we can get to right now but um i'll ask the most salient ones so can you uh so this is a good question and it maybe uh was about when you were talking about having an old 401k at an old employer and now you're working in the government um and you were talking about the forms if they want to roll that over to a a private IRA um, with 
instead of a TSP? Is that an option? Yes, that is an option. Uh, and one that we would even recommend uh, for majority of the cases out there. Uh, but once again, it really just depends on what your objectives are and, um, and what are the options would be best suited for you. Uh, and, and those are things that we discuss to help people understand uh, which side of that option is uh, uh, better for them. Okay. All right. Uh, here's another great question. Should I wait until the market is back up? if I want to make withdrawals. I don't need to right now, um, but I am retired. Uh, so uh, yes, that would be the ideal situation is to withdraw at the highs of the market. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, kind of stay put at the lows of the market because you want as many of the shares uh, that you have invested to accumulate in value uh, down the road. Uh, so if you do not need that, then yes, 100%. Do not touch the money uh, if you can help it. Uh, if you're over the age of 72, different story, right, because of RMD. Uh, but I would say uh, definitely uh, have a consultation with a financial advisor uh, to better help understand your specific situation to make that type of recommendation. Thank you. All right, this is a good question. So you went over all the funds and you talked about the G fund. I, uh, they said, I can't remember what it stands for, but um, the question is with inflation, even when it's low at like two or 3% and it doesn't look like the G fund beats that, why would I invest in that at all? That's a good question. Uh, and that is a hard one to answer because I agree with you and citing that the G fund is not a great place to be investing in. However, that is the only fund that you have that is safe on the platform if you are under the age of 59 and a half and still working. Uh, you have no choice but to invest there if you're investing in the TSP, right? Uh, so it, you can argue then, you know, let me invest in the CNS fund, but look at what the CNS fund is also doing right now. It's down 20% this year. So there's really no, go, no good place to hide. But if you're someone that is conservative or near retirement, then the G fund is the only fund you can invest in uh, because of that. Uh, so it's not because of choice, it's because of there is no other choice. All right. So can you review again the limits on contributions? And is that different for a Roth TSP as opposed to a traditional TSP? Uh, uh, that's a very good question to clarify, actually. So regardless if you put the, the contributions into the traditional or the Roth side of your TSP, your maximum limit, if you're under the age of 50, is still $20,500. Uh, so that's the maximum. If you're over age of 50, the maximum limit is $27,000, regardless if it's in the Roth or traditional side. If it combined together, it cannot be more than 27,000. And then a follow-up question to that. Does that max include the, uh, the agency match? It does not include the agency match. It's only your personal contributions. All right, I'm, I'm gonna, we have time for one more question. Let me see if I can find the one that I wanted to ask here. All right, this is a really great one. You talked about life cycle fund. Can you explain that concept? For example, does it get allocated automatically differently as you age? I, I don't understand that. Okay. So the life cycle fund, uh, there are approximately eight to 10 of them, right? Uh, ranging from the L2025 to the L, I believe it's up to 2060, I believe. So, uh, so th there's a broad range there. And the life cycle fund, they have a fund manager that is allocating that fund as each year goes by, as you get older, okay? And the thought process is the older you get, the more conservative you need to be. So let's use the, the opposite, uh, uh, two opposite spectrums here, L2025 versus L2060. L2025 is assuming you're going to be retiring in the next three years here. 
therefore, if you look at the L2025, and you can get this off tsp.gov, you'll see that majority wise is probably going to be closer to 80% G and F fund, which are your conservative funds, and 20% C, S, and I, which are your growth funds, right? So it's a, almost a mixture of something like that, 80, 20. That's for conservative, right? Because uh, you're soon to retire. And then on the opposite spectrum, you have the L2060. Now, these are the folks that are going to be working for 35 years here. They're going to be, they're very young, maybe in the 20s. They're going to be here for a while. Well, those folks, they should be taking more risk. So if you peel back the layer of the onion uh, for the 2060, you'll see that majority wise, it's probably like 95% C, S, and I funds, and probably only 5% G and F for conservative because they want you to take more risk with the market because you can afford to do so at your younger age uh, throughout the years to achieve maximum return. Uh, so that is the thought process behind that. As you get older, it shifts from the growth funds, which is CSNI, into more of the G and F fund as you're closing, uh, getting closer towards the retirement age uh, for the life cycle fund. Well, folks, that's about all the time we have today for questions. I want to thank Leo for being here and for our attendees. Look for a link to a replay soon of this event. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome to share that with friends or family or fellow employees. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor who's a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you and every one of our advisor partners is committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone.